All right, so it is spooky season. Werewolf by Night is out right now, and in this video, we're going to be breaking down the story, who this hairy little wolf man is, some of the Easter eggs and theories, along with our reaction and review in this first and hopefully not last Marvel special presentation. Uh, a, a special. Werewolf by Night had long been rumored as a Halloween special, but kept very quiet, and it's kind of crazy to see Marvel try their hand at something so out of the box, which could honestly open the door for more supernatural horror Marvel characters like Ghost Rider, Damon Hellstrom, or even Mephisto. That dirty demon dude is gonna show up soon, mark my words. Now, if you enjoy this video, then please shoot a silver bullet at that like button. And also don't forget to subscribe for breakdowns and recaps like this every full moon. Well, actually, it's uh, every day, but full moon sounded better. Uh, never mind. With that out of the way, a huge thank you for clicking this. Now let's get into Werewolf by Night. <laughs> Now it opens on a new Marvel special presentation logo that I assume will be the standard across all of these one-off specials as we get the usual Marvel fanfare intro. However, this intro loses its coloring and the music dips into a horror-like chanting orchestra already showcasing the musical abilities of Michael Giacchino with added claw marks leaning into the werewolf nature of the story and a Frankenstein-like electricity shock transforms the overall aesthetic into something more akin to the 30s or 40s monster movie title cards that this is pulling inspiration from, specifically Universal's The Wolfman intro from 1941. There's a tapestry of our six heroes from 2012's The Avengers movie, as the narrator says, The known universe, with its heroes and marvels. <laughs> Even this guy has puns, as he continues with, But what of the darkness? As we see pages out of an old textbook with what appears to be a vampire, potentially Dracula's true form, the Latin writing on the right can be translated to a winged monster effectively and completely corrupted from virtue or piety. The next monster appears to be a two-headed siren, essentially an alluring fish woman. Oh, I, I can't say that? Oh, okay. Um, woman of fish. These monster illustrations look like older versions of the ones that are featured in the From the Files of Ulysses Bloodstone comic issue, who happens to be introduced as the hunter in these illustrations, warding off that damn Sasquatch, having a similar look to his flashback scenes from the Marvel Presents Bloodstone comics. There's also a mention of hunters taking pride in what they do, which is a striking call out to a certain vampire hunter we're supposed to see pretty soon, Blade. Motherfucker, are you out of your damn mind? Now, Ulysses Bloodstone is the reason this Werewolf by Night story is taking place. Mr. Bloodstone had originally been a caveman kept alive for roughly 10,000 years due to the fragment of the mystic alien blood gem imbued in his chest bone, later referred to as the Bloodstone. He sought revenge against the evil extra-dimensional being, the Hellfire Helix, that had killed his fellow tribespeople and from which the power of the Bloodstone originated from. Sending waves of monsters to stop him on his path of revenge, Bloodstone became an infamous monster slayer, with the Latin stating, the Bloodstone family heroically fought the monsters for the salvation of men. Using the power of the Bloodstone to aid him, a weapon unlike any other was said to grant Bloodstone superhuman stamina, agility, senses, and a vast regenerative powers which prevented him from aging over all of those centuries of his life. Think of an infinity gem like DLC pack. Not as good as the originals, but uh, it still, it still works. However, spoilers, he did. And that's what brings all of the hunters back to Bloodstone Castle for the evening, his funeral. The Latin phrasing next to him gives us a theory on how he potentially passed, stating this tearful Bloodstone Ulysses, the seventh son as far as the stones are concerned, is slain and is slain on the last full moon of the year and at the end of the blood or bloodshed. 
It's a rough translation, but full moon, werewolf, death, it's all connected, man. Anyway, it's a ceremonial hunt involving all of these ominous hunters from across the globe to find out who will be the next to wield the bloodstone. However, there's a slippery little monster man amongst them. We know this is Jack Russell, but we'll talk a little bit more about him a bit later. The hallway he passes through, though, is chocked full of little details. The tapestries on the wall look similar to those of the Bayo Bayou tapestry featuring the Battle of 1066, but instead showing the fight against monsters over the centuries in different cultures. All of the writing on the wall translates to things revolving around the world of monsters and hunting them like a monster known as a bad thing at best to attend the last breath of life, wild dangers the geese flee from victory and death. Honestly, these are just nonsense at this point. The king lives to call to the kingdom and the lyrics of the hit 1962 Bobby Pickett song, Monster Mash. They did the monster mash. The monster mash. Jack admires the wall art, wincing a bit when he sees the depiction of a werewolf being killed, giving us a slight hint, hint, nudge, nudge at his own secret, and honestly could be one of his long-lost hairy little relatives. He enters the main lounge, set up like a hunter's lodge, with dozens of paintings, taxidermied monster heads, other relics across the centuries, and Ulysses' coffin. The paintings look similar to the opening illustrations with Bloodstone facing off against each of the monsters. There are a half dozen or so of these monsters mounted on the wall, of which include familiar favorites like the Sasquatch, Yeti, or Minotaur, to more obscure ones like the Manphibian, or even Chernobog the Black. Keeping with the different hunters over the centuries, we can also see some knight and gladiator armor on the shelves as Jack admires everything. The bloodstone is then shown to be the only thing in color, shining brightly as Jack admires. This is interesting because it's the only color that is breaking through that black and white aesthetic of the special, which I think is similar to Thor Love and Thunder and how powerful artifacts reacted in the Shadow Realm. Everything is devoid of color except the most powerful of items, which subtly shows us that the Bloodstone is nothing to mess with. Jack talks with the Weight Watchers version of Fat Bastard, revealing that it will be his 30th season and that the ammunity am, and anonymity and anonymity, seriously these words, in their line of work is very important, which explains how Jack is able to crash this party. Jack mentions he's had a couple fights with the vampire-looking creature on the wall, joking that he's never looked more alive. I assume that this is Dracula because he recognizes him, and in the comics, Werewolf by Night did have a couple run-ins with Mr. Acula. It's a little nod, but also makes me think that this is set outside of the 616 universe because they wouldn't waste a huge Blade villain on just, you know, a little reference like this. Elsa Bloodstone crashes the party, seen as almost an outcast, returning home after being away for decades. Now, in the comics, Elsa was also a monster hunter, much like her father, likened to that of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, having more of an attitude about doing things her own way. It was said that her father pushed her, almost in an abusive sense, to become this great monster hunter, much like himself, but instead, this manipulation sounds like it drove Elsa away for all of these years, not visiting the Bloodstone Castle until now, demanding that she is the right heir to the bloodstone. Verusa's evil stepmother angle gives off similarities to Maleva, the gypsy sorceress from the original 1941 Wolfman movie. Verusa goes around the room listing off everyone's kill count, which is like awarding little gold stars in grade school as we get a better look at each of these hunters. Barrasso has 26, Azriel has 37, Leorn has 43, Joven with an impressive 57, and Jack well over 100. Even him being a bit surprised by that number, again hinting that he maybe doesn't belong. Verusa refers to the group as Death Dealers, which could be a slight nod to the villain of Shang-Chi that goes by the same name. 
Elsa being an outcast amongst these other hunters doesn't have her kill count listed off, potentially meaning that it's secretive or that she actually doesn't have any monsters under her belt. The other hunters also sport some sort of facial feature or deformity, whether it be a nose ring, scar, no eyebrows, face paint, while Elsa is just herself, subliminally showing that she doesn't belong. Elsa interrupts Verusa moving a table just like Will Smith does in Men in Black. Wanna get down on this? Marvel likes their humor, as you can see a this end up disclaimer on the back of Ulysses' coffin, and in front of his coffin is a sword crossed with his iconic shotgun he favored in the comics. Billy Swan, who is this little dude just cranking away, is essentially the Igor character in all of the Frankenstein monster movies that's there to do, you know, essentially the busy work. In this case, crank that zombie boy! You Ulysses is cranked out like some run-down Chuck E. Cheese animatronic and gives the hunters the mission of the evening. To me, Ulysses kind of looks like the zombie, aka Simon Garth from the comics, but I guess all zombies look the same to me. I, I, I didn't mean that. I'm, I'm not zombies. Please don't cancel me. But yeah, like an old Haunted Mansion animatronic, Ulysses states a powerful monster will be released in the sacred grounds with the hunters having to Hunger Games it, slaying the monster, and whoever does will be the rightful bearer of the Bloodstone. But the catch is that the Bloodstone will be affixed to the hide of the monster, both weakening it, great, I love to hear that, while also making it very, very angry. Reinforcing the Hunger Games Battle Royale treatment, each of the hunters must sacrifice their bloodstone pendants to participate in the hunt, essentially drawing straws for the order of entering the sacred grounds. Jack receives the Saxon rune for Fay, meaning F or first, but also is the symbol for wealth or cattle, which can then be broken down further into prosperity, luck, or new beginnings, being quite a foreshadow at how uh, all of this turns out for him. Jack is the first to enter the maze, following a relative of the flaming guitar man from Mad Max Fury Road who had a love for the tuba. I guess art imitates life. The hunters recite a hunter's oath for those who forged our blade to rid this land of its abominations. A <laughs> name drop. Who would have thought that Blonsky would be in She-Hulk and Werewolf by Night at the same time? But nah, I couldn't find any reference to the actual oath that they speak, but it does feel similar to the speeches or prayers from Boondock Saints, like a promise before taking lives. Elsa comes across an old-timey record player playing Vera Lynn's Wishing Will Make It So from 1939. Just imagine that you are back in childhood the lyrics are a clever bit of foreshadowing and backstory for Elsa, meaning she had wishes as a child, I'm guessing to be a great monster hunter like her father, but things went awry. Though she is older now, wish again, obviously being the rightful bearer of the bloodstone, and who knows, it could happen now. Jack crosses paths with Elsa, and here we can kind of infer that both of these two are kind of unlike the other hunters being more pacifist, avoiding confrontation, as Jack suggests they just kind of pass each other by. Joven swoops in like Gimli trying to take them out, only to be taken out like a chump. Elsa steals his axe, and Joven curses death upon the hit 1994 movie, Lassie. Death is coming for you, Lassie! Uh, ex what, what do you mean? He, he's Scottish? Oh. Huh. A nice attention to detail here are the two quick cigarette burns in the top right corner of the screen. This is a term used in filmmaking because they look like little burns caused by actual cigarettes. But they indicate that a change of reels is coming, in this case, a scene change. The more you know, you're welcome. Elsa crosses some corroded hand and footprints, so you know, Quentin Tarantino isn't far away. Ha <laughs> ha, foot humor. It's good for the soul. Anyway, giving us further hints at the man, or potentially thing, that is hunting them. As she passes the corridor, the light fixtures almost look like upside-down crosses, which in pop culture has gained fame as a demonic symbol. 
Elsa's altercation with Leorn results in him giving her a hand and is hella brutal because he is squirting blood all over the place, which oddly enough reminded me of Adam's Family Values, the talent show scene. It, it's just squirting everywhere. Through this fighting, we can see that Elsa has been trained, maybe not by her father, but she's proficient enough. I mean, it left Leorn speechless. Ha <laughs> ha! Yeah, he, uh, well, he's dead. Jack is grabbed by the mystery monster we've heard so much about, which turns out to be Man-Thing. Now, this monster is interesting because he's part man and, uh, well, well, part, part thing, yeah. <laughs> In the comics, Man-Thing used to be Dr. Theodore Salas, who was a biochemist working in the Everglades. He was basically attempting to recreate the Super Soldier Serum. However, after AIM tried to steal his research, he injected himself with the serum, crashed his car into a magical swamp, and ended up turning into the slow-moving swamp monster called Man-Thing, possessing a variety of abilities. Now, MCU origin-wise, this could be the same, we're not entirely sure, but there is a rumored Man-Thing special in the works, so we may get some answers very very soon. Another thing about Man-Thing is that the magical swamp that he dwells in is a nexus to all realities, essentially a pathway to any and all realities. Think the Monsters, Inc. door technology, but only one singular door, and Man-Thing is basically the guardian of it. There was actually a reference to this and Nexus events in one of the WandaVision commercials featuring a pill called Nexus that could theoretically take you to any reality you wanted. So a subtle connection old Kev Dog may lean into later down the road. Jack is actually undercover on a rescue mission to rescue his old buddy Man-Thing, working on an escape plan. He's locked into a crypt with Elsa, learning more about one another, along with a proper, finally, introduction from Jack Russell stating his family was a bit different. Aside from Jack's name being a pun of a dog, I mean, Jack Russell, Jack, Jack Russell Terrier, I, I can't be the only one. He is, well, he is a werewolf. Essentially, a descendant of Russell had been inflicted by a werewolf's curse centuries earlier when fighting Dracula. Hint, hint, back to the vampire. And this passed on generation to generation, making Russell the current werewolf by night. His origins are a bit messy, ranging from almost a teen wolf approach, with him finding out about his powers when he turned 18, to his ancestors having been involved in finding pages to the Darkhold. When turning into the savage werewolf, Jack possesses all of the traits and abilities you'd think comes along with that. Gluten intolerance, silver being one of the biggest weaknesses, and he does lose his intellect in the transformation, becoming a savage beast. However, in the comics, years later after training, Russell is able to hone in on this, allowing his intellect to stay with him, similar to kind of what we saw with Smart Hulk in Endgame. The conversation between Elsa and Jack humanizes them from the other hunters, showing that each of them kind of has alternative motives than the deadly Hunger Games that are afoot. I really enjoyed this softer moment between the characters and how they kind of connect on this differing family dynamics, showing how we uh, kind of perceive them as monsters when actually they are far from. But the crypt also has a handful of Easter eggs with the names on each of the tombs. Jacob Howell is a combination of Jacob Balcom and Matt Howell, who are the hosts of the Werewolf by Night podcast. David Long is a prop master who's worked on some previous MCU projects. Brandon Cleela is an art director, Griffith Burke could refer to Job Burke, the son of Man-Thing, and Beverly could be a reference to Beverly Switzler, Howard the Duck's girlfriend. Uh, this one. We get a better look at Man-Thing dissolving Joven into effectively nothingness while his screams sound like Marv from Home Alone. Elsa uses Man-Thing's real name of Ted to calm down the wild beast and gain his trust. They then escape through the maze, which looks identical to Hulk chasing Black Widow on the Hello Carrier in The Avengers. Man-Thing escaping into the wilderness almost feels like a Frankenstein's monster type escape, with the innocence of the monster being revealed when the bloodstone is revealed, similar to the innocence of Frankenstein's monster. The smiles and swelling music is uh, cut short when Jack attempts to pick up the bloodstone, only to be blasted back. The bloodstone had been used to ward off monsters, much like we saw in the opening illustrations, revealing that Jack, even though we already knew this, is in fact a monster. There's a couple more cigarette burns as the scene changes over to Jack and Elsa in quite a 
Harry situation. Jack reveals he's not a human human per se while cleverly scratching behind his ear like a dog. In order to keep Elsa safe, he grabs her scent like a dog. He needs to remember this and tells Elsa no matter what, do not break eye contact. This is because in some species of predators, the worst thing you can do is look away from them. Like Kevin spoilers himself, oh dear no. Elsa thinks this is crazy, but uh, lets it go. <laughs> Asking if it had worked before, Jack softly states yes once before, suggesting that maybe a wife, loved one, or family member was spared previously, while so many others had unfortunately been taken by his curse. This whole sequence with Verusa taunting Jack in the cage feels very similar to the cage scene from Silence of the Lambs, maybe just as bloody as Verusa then uses the bloodstone to transform Jack. An interesting thing about this whole bloodstone is that it looks like it uses some form of chaos magic, from the red glow, the way the energy waves flow through the air, and even creates a similar lens flare to what we saw when Scarlet Witch used her attack. So if you were unsure about its power level, now you know. The transformation of Jack into the werewolf by night is in line with, you know, other werewolf-like transformations being shrouded in the shadows as we see him morph from a human into a much more savage beast. Similar enough, I think Jurassic Park had a decent influence on this because Jack grabbing Verusa towards the cage and then being shocked by all of the guards instantly took me to the opening scene of Jurassic Park with the raptor ripping a worker in and then they have to go and shock it. Jack's screams even sound similar, resulting in a pissed off wolfman. This whole action sequence is straight up banana sandwiches. Jack is absolutely brutal, fighting like a scrappy bar brawler at 2am not paying their tab, more so than a complete monster. But I was surprised by how graphic and bloody it was, not only from Jack's action, I mean, he did do a Mike Tyson ear bite on this dude, but also with Elsa fighting off the other hunters. It even feels like a first person shooter in a sense, with the blood splattering against the lens and remaining there while the action continues to escalate. Elsa uses Jack's real name to help calm him down, much like she used Teddy's earlier when talking with Man-Thing, but Jack also remembers her scent and her not breaking eye contact. This scene is great because it shows how Jack isn't fully a monster and how Elsa, even though a monster hunter, fully realizes she can be gentle and reason with these beasts rather than, you know, acts of violence towards them. The old traditional way of hunting is literally ended with Man-Thing crispy frying Verusa and tossing her like a white Goodman dodgeball straight into Ulysses' coffin, symbolizing the end of an era of hunting. The ending is a two-part conclusion in a sense, with it first focusing on Elsa taking on the role of leader of this new regime of monster hunters, with Billy Swan, aka the Igor character from earlier, catering to his new master. A soft melody from Wizard of Oz's Somewhere Over the Rainbow begins to play as color bleeds out of the bloodstone. Oh wow, that, uh, that's two on the nose to bring new life to Elsa and the entire screen. It sort of reminded me of Pleasantville with all of the color filling the screen, and we see Elsa's familiar red outfit that she sports in the comics. While the song has a deeper meaning of hope, that bad times will be over one day, symbolizing that Elsa and the Bloodstone legacy are on to better times, instead of hunting monsters, she's now working with them. The idea of opening up to people without prejudice and shows that the hunters were actually the real monsters all along, or, you know, some inspirational mumbo jumbo, y you know what I'm saying. The song continues to play as Jack and Man-Thing are okay. There's a fun banter between the two about always, you know, who's rescuing who, and then they suggest that they go grab some sushi together. It's more of a fun end cap, but the sushi bit feels like it's taking a note from when Tony and the others go and get shawarma at the end of The Avengers. There's also some random objects at the camp, including luggage, French press, cowbell, playing cards, a guitar, and payphone. Now, a payphone was something people used to. <laughs> I'm not going to mansplain a payphone to you. You get it. Dial down the center with 1-800-C-A-L-L-A-T-T. -T. Okay, okay, okay. I'm done, I promise. Man-Thing probably grabbed all of these random objects from his Nexus to All Realities portal that we mentioned earlier, but also shows that he is entirely off the grid. The special comes to a close with the classic The End titling, which is identical to 1941's Citizen Kane, and also used in 2019's The Joker. 
Now, the special seems fairly self-contained without referencing much of the canonized MCU we know, so there aren't many theories on where, you know, this could go. Hell, somewhere over the rainbow could be interpreted as this story happening in a completely different multiverse, a fever dream in a sense, but that kind of feels like a dirty Wizard of Oz cop-out. With rumored specials for both Elsa Bloodstone and Man-Thing in the works, these could be set up to tell almost a prologue to this with the origins of Man-Thing and an epilogue with Elsa showing off where the Bloodstone legacy takes her, potentially weaving into the upcoming Blade movie. Hey, she's into monsters, he's into vampires, it could happen. If Marvel followed this theory while still making these self-contained stories, I'd be on board. They could even go as far as, you know, introducing Elsa's brother being the antagonist, vying for the Bloodstone, or Werewolf by Night and Man-Thing creating some sort of... monster squad? Overall though, Werewolf by Night is probably my favorite project out of Phase 4 so far. With it adapting this like old school 40s monster movie aesthetic, it's grounded but weird, serious but fun, happy but violent, like the carnage was an interesting change of pace for Marvel. And honestly, this was one hell of a gamble out of the box experiment that I think warrants a couple more of these one-off specials. This might be the way about going with things rather than making everything meticulously connected because it entirely works on its own. Sure, I was waiting for a post credit stinger of Mahersha Ali's blade to walk in, but it wasn't needed. And you know who made all of this work so well together? His name was Mike. Fucking Mike. His musical score instantly set the mood, and the love for older monster movies can thoroughly be seen throughout this, even down to the fake cigarette burns in the corners. The biggest flea on this werewolf is that I wish that it was a feature length. You know, the 50-ish minute length does help to keep things tight, but there is so much more about this world, these characters, the relationships, hell, even the backstory and lore for characters we didn't even see. Now, this could all be remedied with the rumor of more of these Marvel special presentations, slowly building a world of standalone supernatural monsters. Half of me wants the connection, while the other half is completely fine with what we got. But obviously, I would love to hear your thoughts. No, seriously, let me know. What did you think of Werewolf by Night, or rather WBN, like all of us cool kids are saying, and if these one-off specials are the next step in the right direction for Marvel Studios? We're currently running a competition right now, giving away three copies of Thor Love and Thunder on the 15th of October. And how you get entered, all you gotta do is like this video, make sure to subscribe with notifications on, and drop a comment down below on your thoughts of Werewolf by Night. We pick the comments at random at the end of the month, and the winners of the last month are on screen right now. So if that is you, message Paul on Twitter at Heavy Spoilers. If you want something else to watch, be sure to check out some of our other cool videos right over there, whether it be our She-Hulk breakdowns or Rick and Morty Season 6 coverage. With that out of the way, thanks for sticking through this video. I've been Jared, and it's unfortunate you're watching this on a full moon because... <coughs> <coughs> sorry, sorry, that was a hairball. <laughs> Thanks, you're the best. Bye-bye now. Ah!